today's Grok Day session, where we'll be talking about reinventing compilers for AI. My name's Andrew Ling. I am a software director here at Grok, and I will be joined by my colleague, Roberto Giacecco, who is a technical lead here at Grok in the area of compilers and ML frameworks. So for today, what we'll basically be diving into is four key areas. First, we'll talk about the Grok compiler and where it fits in in the overall software solution that Grok provides. Additionally, give you insights into how we actually achieve world-class performance using the Grok compiler today in a fully automated fashion. Once you understand that, we'll basically describe how we actually approach uh, compilation onto the Grok chip using the Grok compiler using a relatively small example, specifically matrix matrix decomposition and really taking a look deep into that and how we actually map that onto the Grok chip in an efficient manner. Additionally, we'll show how we do some data layout transforms using the Grok compiler to run on the Grok chip. And then finally, I'll pass it on to my colleague, Roberto, who'll demonstrate some of these transformations on the fly and illustrate its impact on overall performance. So here I'm basically showing you the three key components that Grok delivers in its Grokware suite. First, the Grok compiler, which really takes standardized models from standardized frameworks like PyTorch or TensorFlow and compiles that down onto the Grok chip in a fully automated fashion. Additionally, we provide Grok API, which really you can think of it as a bare metal programming model that allows you fine grain control and customization when using our hardware. Paired with this are our Grok utils, which allows you to do performance profiling and debug. And it's used in conjunction with the Grok API and Grok compiler to help optimize your programs. Here's a high level depiction of all these components working together. If you take a look on the left-hand side, you can see our Grok compilation flow which really takes a PyTorch or TensorFlow input that gets passed on into an Onyx format, which gets ingested into our Onyx front end. That in turn is processed by our MLAR based Grok compiler and then is scheduled. The output of that is passed to our Grok assembler, which generates machine level code, effectively the binary, which in turn is run through the Grok runtime and then onto the Grok chip. In parallel, there's the Grok API flow. Again, as I mentioned, this is a bare metal programming model that really gives you that fine grain control in certain situations where PyTorch and TensorFlow are not sufficient to express your applications, or if you want some predictable customization to be done on the Grok chip. For this presentation, we're really focused on the Grok compilation flow. Now to illustrate the benefits of using the Grok compiler and how it's actually performing today. Here's a simple depiction of the compilation of various matrix multiplies through the Grok compiler and the overall utilization that we're actually able to achieve on the Grok chip using the Grok compiler. So in this diagram, you can see three lines. The top line or dotted line is effectively the expected utilization that we expect to achieve using the Grok compiler over time. As you can see, on our chip and architecture, we can actually achieve 100% utilization for certain matrix sizes. The solid orange line is what we're actually achieving out of the Grok compiler today. And it's relatively close to the expected utilization. And with time, with further optimizations, we do anticipate that the dotted line and solid line should converge to be the same thing. In addition to that, we compare against conventional architectures and the utilization that you can achieve on a conventional architecture like a GP GPU. And that is shown in the green line here. And as you can see with conventional architectures, you are very limited in terms of what you can actually do on the chip, depending on your problem size. So you as a designer have to be very conscious and very careful in terms of your problem size Otherwise, you will severely underutilize the chip to the point that in some cases, you actually can't even use half the chip or half of the performance that should be expected out of the device. One key takeaway of this is with the Grok compiler, it is a fully automated flow. So 
unlike conventional approaches to compilation, we do not hand tune anything or generate a hand tuned library where the Grok compiler delegates its performance to. Again, this contrasts with traditional architectures like CPUs and GPUs, which generally have to resort to hand tuned libraries written by engineers directly at a low level to achieve peak performance or peak utilization out of their device. So taking a look more broadly, here are some additional workloads that we've compiled through the Grok compiler. And we show that we can actually achieve world-class results today using the Grok compiler through a fully automated flow. On the left-hand side, what we're showing are a set of transformers compiled both on conventional architectures and comparing the overall latency that we can achieve versus a Grok chip. And as you can see, for these specific workloads, namely transformers, we're able to actually achieve almost 2x performance benefit when using the Grok chip and Grok compiler. Additionally, with these large workloads, it's well known that the performance achieved by conventional architectures are leveraging hand-tuned libraries or low-level assembly programming to achieve that performance as opposed to fully running it through their automated compilation flow. Similarly, if you take a look at the right-hand diagram, there's a set of LSTMs which also achieve peak performance using the Grok chip and significantly perform significantly better than conventional architectures provided by Intel and NVIDIA. Now, to give you a sense of how we're actually able to achieve this level of performance on our architecture, I want to really show you what the architecture itself looks like. So here is a somewhat cartoon depiction of what's actually available on our hardware. And it really consists of four key components. An M MXM, or matrix execution model, which is able to process matrix multiplies extremely efficiently. A SXM, or switching execution model, module, which basically can do data layout transforms relatively efficiently on the chip. A low latency, high bandwidth memory, which is able to process data extremely efficiently. And then finally, a VXM or vector execution module, which is able to process extremely wide vector lanes of information in a SIMD like fashion. So to think about how data is actually processed on this chip, you can really take a simplistic view and focus on the base unit of operation, which is a 320 element vector, which is roughly the vector size of the hardware that we support. And data in terms of a mental model is really just flowing in a horizontal fashion, left to right or right to left. As it's flowing in this horizontal lane, it's being ingested into memory and functional units in an extremely efficient manner. You can almost think of this as a assembly line of tensors being processed down a stream of data, thereby creating extreme amount of efficiency as you're transforming data down the assembly line. So to give you a real concrete sense of how we're actually compiling to this chip using the Grok compiler, let's take a look at a matrix matrix operation to really drive home that point and give you intuitive sense of how this is actually working. So let's say I have a basic matrix matrix operation shown here, which consists of multiplying two matrices of rank two. What I'm gonna do is first decompose them into 320 by 320 tiles as shown here. Again, 320 being the general vector size of our hardware that we support today. Next, what I'm gonna do is extract out a singular vector of size 320 out of the first matrix, and then a 320 by 300 tile out of the second matrix, and then perform a basic sub matrix operation that is a 320 multiplied by a 320 by 320 matrix to get a singular output vector of 320 as shown here. Now this process is repeated for the entire column of the first matrix. And what you end up is with a full column of results at the output. Once you have that, you continue to the next 320 by 320 tile and the process continues. 
how this is actually operated on hardware is shown here. So basically, this is a zoomed in view into the matrix multiply unit, or MXM plane, within the hardware, which basically is an extremely efficiently efficient 320 by 320 circuit to do matrix multiplies of that size. So what we'll actually do, as I mentioned before, you'll extract out a 320 element vector from the first matrix, and then a 320 by 320 tile out of the second matrix. What we do is actually install those weights onto the 320 by 320 plane such that that data is co-resident with the compute. Once we have that, we're able to freely stream these 320 element vectors back to back into the MXM plane and achieve a high utilization of the hardware. As it turns out, there's actually four of these planes within a single chip. Therefore, every single cycle, we're actually able to perform four of these operations in parallel. Of course, data transformations are also extremely important for machine learning workloads today. And you can achieve good utilization of the chip and achieve very efficient data tr transformations uh, using the Grok chip today. So here is one such example of a data transformation that's common to a lot of computer vision applications, where you take in an input image, usually of layout CHW in row major order. And then oftentimes what you want to do is convert that input image layout into a layout that is much more amenable or can be much more efficiently processed on the Grok chip. So in our case, what we specifically do is we convert that CHW layout into what we call a Grok tiled HWC format, which effectively interleaves the channels within the image uh, back to back within a vector and then sends it into the MXM or VXM hardware that's on the Grok chip. Now to illustrate this, we have a demonstration here that my colleague Roberto will actually show where he's actually taking the YOLO model and doing the data layout transform that I talked about previously on the chip and automatically through the compiler. Thank you, Andrew, for passing it on. Um, so the Grok chip has a, a SIMD style architecture with a very large vector length. With that information, it might be compelling to think that some amount of pre-processing of the input data on the host might be a desirable thing to do. What I'm going to show in this example are three different examples of running a YOLO model on the chip with pre-processing done both on the host and on the device to illustrate that that's not actually the case because Grok's chip has very powerful functional units to allow us to do this data manipulation on chip. So the very first example that I'm going to show is running the YOLO model, assuming that there's a certain amount of tiling done on on the host ahead of time for both the input and the output data. So what you'll see here is that we're hitting roughly 8.4 milliseconds per example here. Um, so th the way you can think of this is that this, this particular number is the lower bound of what we could hope to achieve if we were to do this input pre-processing on the host. Um, so the reason why it's a lower bound is because we're not actually doing the transformation yet on the host, we're just transferring an expanded amount of data in this kind of tiled format that is amenable to Grok's architecture. So next, what I'll show is an, exa an example of actually running this uh, tiling on the host. Um, so what you'll see here is that it's notably slower. It's taking a little bit of time, and it comes in at roughly 0.5 seconds, per example. So the tiling that I'm doing here is, is a fairly naive implementation. And in theory, we could put in significantly more engineering effort to get asymptotically closer to this 8.4 milliseconds from above. But that would take quite a bit of engineering effort. And the alternative, which is a very compelling approach, is to actually leverage the fact that the compiler will automatically do this transformation for us directly on chip. So that's what I'll show next. And in this case, what you'll see actually is that we're now down to two, 2.1 milliseconds per example. So not only is it significantly faster and easier, it's 
also lower than the lower bound of doing it on the host. And the reason for that is actually that while we're doing more work on the Grok chip now, what's happening is, is that we're transferring significantly less data to and from the host as part of running the YOLO model. So in this case, uh, rather than doing some amount of expansion, we're leveraging Grok's powerful functional units on chip to do that expansion for us. And not only that, but it's done by the compiler in an automatic fashion. So it's something that people using the chip don't even need to worry about. And with that, I'll pass it back to Andrew now. Thank you, Roberto, for that. And this basically concludes this session for today, where we talked about how Grok is reinventing compilers today and are able to achieve world-class performance in an automated fashion through our software. For more information, please visit our website at grok.com. And of course, we're always looking for talented individuals to come join us in our journey. For Im information on that, please visit our website at grok.com careers. Thank you.